Edwin. Hello. Hi. Thank you for being here for another CTG Masterclass. Welcome to Sevilla. Thank you. Um, we thought that uh, given the fact that you have recently published the article about meconium called The Significance of Non-Significant Meconium uh, Amniotic Fluid Color versus Content, Yes. Uh, we could discuss this about meconium and the impact that has in perinatal outcomes. That's right. And uh, before I start, well done in uh, m managing to get almost 600 delegates. Okay. So I'm, I'm great, uh, very, very grateful to be here. Okay, thank you very much. So tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit about this article. Yeah, so uh, lots of babies pass meconium or caca, mostly after they are born. But some of them do pass the meconium inside. So there is some kind of confusion about looking at the meconium, whether it's thin or thick, or significant or non-significant, and to manage them differently. Mm -hmm. So this article is about showing the importance that if I'm a baby in a room like this, filled with fluid, amniotic fluid, and I put caca into this room, and I churn it up by moving, mm -hmm. and if I have meconium all around me, surely that has problems. And this article is about that situation. Okay, so let me get this through. Uh, then the, f the only fact of having meconium, uh, is it harmful for the baby? Is that right? Yeah, so let's work out what does meconium contain. So apart from 85% water, it contains pancreatic enzymes, mm -hmm. it contains gastric juice, it contains all the inflammatory cells from the gut, but also the baby sheds all the skin, uh, vernix, and constantly swallows, all that gets digested as meconium. So if you put that stuff around you, yes, it's going to have a problem. Okay. So how do you think we should manage um, the labor when there is meconium? Yes, the first thing is to understand that there's nothing like thin or thick. It's just having your orange juice concentrate on a big jug of water or a small glass of water. So thin and thick tells you how much of amniotic fluid is there to dilute it. So if you have thin meconium, it means the baby has lots of amniotic fluid. If you have thick meconium, that means either placenta is not working, oligohydramnios, and the concentration is higher. But if I put meconium around me, it's going to squeeze the umbilical cord, so I can have umbilical cord spasm, or sometimes necrosis of the umbilical cord, because it has got proteolytic enzymes. And normally, if I'm a fetus, my amniotic fluid is able to digest and kill the bacteria called phagocytosis. But if I put caca or meconium around me, it'll inactivate the amniotic fluid bacteriostatic activity, which means I'm more likely to get infection. And also, please uh, don't forget that babies breathe they practice movements uh, by breathing in and out of the amniotic fluid. So if I pass meconium around me, that amniotic fluid that I'm going to take into my lungs will also have meconium. But usually, as a human fetus, I'm able to digest and kill off that meconium, absorb it with lung macrophages. But if you cause me hypoxia, oxygen deprivation, or infection, chorioamnionitis, my alveolar defense mechanisms won't be working normally. That is the time I develop a condition called meconium aspiration syndrome. So you ask me how best to manage these babies with meconium. The best way is to avoid hypoxic stress or infection when there is meconium. Because if I have meconium aspiration syndrome, my surfactant in the lungs, not only they get uh, replaced and depressed, my pulmonary blood vessels, they undergo spasm. So I can't oxygenate myself. So not only I have a problem inside the womb, when I come out, the neonatologist may not be able to oxygenate me, and I can get hypoxic injury due to meconium aspiration syndrome. features 
can we expect um, to see on the CTG trades when there is an economy involved? Yeah, that's a very good question because traditionally all the guidelines were concentrating on decelerations because everything was about hypoxia. But meconium is infection, it's sepsis, it's inflammation. And if I'm a baby, I don't have properly developed blood-brain barrier. So if I'm getting infection, not only the bacteria, but the inflammatory mediators like tumor necrosis factor alpha, interferons, interleukins, they cross my blood-brain barrier and they cause neuroinflammation. So if you translate that into a CTG trace, my baseline heart rate, because I have temperature due to sepsis, might increase by 10% from my original baseline without any decelerations because I don't have hypoxia. So I might come to you at 40 weeks with a baseline heart rate about 120. If I get one degree rise in temperature, and my baseline heart rate might increase to 132 to 35, and my guidelines will miss me as a fetus because they say I should have a baseline between 110 to 160. So a rise in the baseline for the same baby according to gestational age without any preceding deceleration, we need to be thinking of sepsis due to meconium aspiration syndrome. The second issue is as I get more and more inflammation in the brain, I lose my deep sleep. So normally as a term fetus, just like an adult, I go into deep sleep, non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep, and REM sleep, uh, approximately every 50 minutes. But once I get inflammation inside my brain, I lose my deep sleeps. So my variability may be same, according to guidelines, I may be normal. I may have a baseline variability of 15 beats per minute, but I wouldn't show you a change. So if you put these features together in a baby with meconium, what we are trying to avoid in that baby is chorioaminonitis. So we are going to look for increase in the baseline without deceleration, absence of cycling. And also, as I get progressively unwell and sick, I stop moving, so loss of accelerations. Now, you recently published a paper, in fact today, on a new feature called zigzag pattern. Can you please elaborate a little bit on zigzag pattern? The idea is that fetal heart rate variability reflects the integrity of the central nervous system. In a progressive abdominal hypoxia, with time, what tends to happen is the variability decreases. Mm -hmm. But if there is an acute, rapidly evolving hypoxia, uh, it might happen that baby doesn't have time in order to secrete catecholamines to obtain more oxygen. And what happens is the sympathetic nervous system increases the fetal heart rate in order to obtain more oxygen. And at the same time, parasympathetic nervous system decreases the fetal heart rate in order to reduce myocardial um, workload. And th therefore, what we are going to see is a fight between I sympathetic see. and parasympathetic nervous system, and there is an autonomic instability. This we can see it quite often especially um, by the end, as um, what we have called zigzag pattern, which is as an up and down fluctuation of with variability more than 25 bits per minute, lasting for at least one minute. And this is different from the saltatory pattern, which has been defined by international guidelines as um, variability more than 25 bytes per minute, but during 30 minutes and in a uniform bandwidth. So it differs from it in terms of duration and uniformity. What we have done is that we have reviewed 500 CTGs uh, looking for saltatory pattern and zigzag pattern and we have correlated them with prenatal outcomes such as APCA scores, pH core gases and uh, neonatal admission. Uh, and what we found is that significantly there is a an increase in APGA scores of 7 or less than 7 at first and fifth minutes when there is zigzag pattern. Also there is a trend to mild and moderate acidosis and what is most impressive is that there is a 
eightfold times admission to a neonatal unit mm -hmm. when zigzag pattern lasted for one minute and 11 full times admission to neonatal unit when zigzag pattern lasted for two minutes. I mean, that's a very important information because you asked me about CTG and how to improve outcomes. So in second stage of labor, if someone is using oxytocin, not only second stage, even in first stage, if they find the zigzag pattern that shows you acutely evolving hypoxia, that increases the risk of fetal gasping reflex and meconium aspiration syndrome. So that's something that we need to avoid. Uh, my, one of my trainees from Italy, Letizia Galli, uh, we had a collaborative project with Italy and St. George's in London. We published our paper on subclinical and clinical chorioamnionitis in October 2019. And we have also shown that zigzag pattern, loss of cycling, loss of acceleration and the rise in the baseline are associated with subclinical chorioamnionitis. Not only that, not only meconium increases the risk of fetal infection, chorioamnionitis, but if baby has chorioamnionitis, by swallowing the infected amniotic fluid, which causes gastroenteritis, just like you and I eating a rotten Kentucky Fried Chicken leg, Yes. after a few days. So it, it, the baby gets diarrhea. And that's why we found that with chorioamnionitis, there's an 18-fold increase in detecting meconium in the amniotic fluid. So your study is also very important, not only in a non-meconium situation, it is more important in babies with chorioamnionitis or with meconium in the amniotic fluid. And the best way to manage these babies is to look at the rate of progress of labor. Is she a primary gravida or multigravida? What else is going on? Are we using too much of oxytocin? And to reduce all those additional stresses so we avoid meconium aspiration syndrome, at the same time, we don't increase unnecessary operative interventions for the moment. So one other thing we could do maybe is if we are in the end of the labor and the mother is pushing and we, we see zigzag pattern on the CTG train, trace, could be a good idea just to tell the mother to stop pushing for a second, uh, to stop oxytocin if, if there is infusion and maybe let the baby um, recover and keep going in turn. That's a very good idea. So if you see me in the gym, uh, panting and about to die, just slow down my treadmill a few few minutes. Let me relax, recover, <laughs> recover uh, take away that zigzag pattern from my mind, and then ask me to go at a slower speed later on. In a labor situation, as you have rightly said, if there is meconium, if there is evidence of hypoxic insult, let's assist the birth with a vacuum of forceps after about 30 minutes so that we don't allow the woman to keep pushing mm -hmm. and increase the stress. We can pull and push at the same time. Okay. Thank you. And I would like to congratulate you once again. You have been an excellent fellow at St. George's and it's very impressive that single-handedly you have managed to get 580 delegates tomorrow for the CTG Masterclass. Okay. And good luck with your physiological state <laughs> as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Creo que tiene mucha utilidad para la práctica clínica de la gente que estamos en paritorio todos los días y que bueno que nos puede ayudar al manejo de, de, lo, de las embarazadas que vienen tanto de parto como para inducirse y, y bueno la verdad que me ha gustado mucho. El evento como residente de Matrona me ha parecido muy interesante porque te hace pensar sobre todo el registro que tú piensas que son patológicos que luego acaban siendo normales y creo que el curso está muy interesante para que lo hicieran todos los residentes porque te da, te da a pensar. 
Lo que más me, me ha gustado es que saber analizar los registros punto por punto y saber en qué fijarnos y cuándo hay que acabar un parto y no alargar de más lo que antes alargábamos. Thank you.